welcome everyone to Really Dicey. Today we have a special guest, John Hulahan of Modifius Entertainment, and we're going to talk about his child, uh, Akhtun Cthulhu, um, for Modifius Games. And now this game has been out for some time, but there are some new um, updates happening to it. Um, be before we get into that, um, uh, John, would you like to explain actually exactly what is Akhtun Cthulhu? Well, Actum Cthulhu um, was originally developed as a setting for um, sixth edition Call of Cthulhu, developed by uh, Chris Birch or, or uh, created by Chris Birch, who's uh, Modifius Entertainment's uh, overlord. And um, it's basically um, Lovecraftian cosmic horror meets the sort of heroism and um, of Second World War. Um, we call it. Um, World War II with tentacles for a kind of shorthand. <laughs> and it's, uh, it developed as um, originally as a Kickstarter and then went on to have a pretty successful line of um, campaigns and adventures, some of which I wrote and plenty of other people wrote too. Um, a seventh edition came out when that updated and now we've been beavering away in top secret bunkers for the past uh, probably couple of years. Um, Making a new 2D20 version, which is actor, which is Modifius's own house system. So, for those that are curious about conversion, exactly, uh, what can fans of of this of this game expect to see change exactly? Well, in the old versions, sixth and seventh edition Call of Cthulhu, they were sort of specifically written for that Call of Cthulhu Chaos system, which is a great system. I absolutely loved it. I played it for well, it's over. I think it's must be over 25 years now but the move to um i, I suppose the the one kind of limitation well there's a couple of limitations with using someone else's system um call of cthulhu is very much written in that classic lovecraftian investigation um you know deep uh, terror light you know investigating strange texts and unusual tones um and it's a great system but it's not very action orientated as you'd kind of expect, you know, the gods and entities of the mythos are hugely terrifying and you can't really, you know, even the biggest gun is not going to make much of an impression on them. So it was always kind of, although it was a great system, I always felt it was kind of a little bit of compromise for a setting which uses World War II where the focus is you know, very much on combat and action. So the uh, 2D20 is Modifius' in-house system and it's used in things like Conan and John Carter and Infinity. And every time we um, use it in a new title, it kind of gets adapted to that new title. So the 2D20 uh, version of Acton Cthulhu is kind of how we've always wanted to play it. A lot more sort of fast-paced, pulpy, um, and um, you know, using the sort of in-house momentum and threat system to really make it a roller coaster ride. You know, we want you to think, um, I guess, like Indiana Jones on steroids, basically. Turned up to 11 as you dash through this kind of, there's still plenty of cosmic horror and terror and all that kind of thing, but it's it's just probably a little bit more fast paced and action oriented than your classic Call of Cthulhu 6th and 7th editions. So if, if you're looking to separate this from the, uh, the 6C version, uh, are you looking, for this book to be like a standalone book so, so that if you want to play in a more to setting and we're using Cthulhu, this is the book to get and to get and to get only yeah absolutely there's um it, actually we originally were going to publish one big core cool book um but we've decided to split it into two now so we've got a game master's book and a player's book um and absolutely um you will if you um you get both of those or you get one of those you will have everything you need to start, um, you know, to kick off in this uh, intriguing universe. Okay, so what can we expect when it comes to, um, I don't think class is the right word to, to describe, like the occupations that are available. How does that change? Yeah, well, we've, um, Nathan uh, Dowdo is a system developer. We work really closely with him to kind of um, uh, create some really interesting characters. And there are broad sort of archetypes like, Boffin and soldier and commander, but we your character is basically created from three uh, major um, major influences. So there's their archetype, their background, and their characteristic, and these combine to give you a kind of 
I mean, you absolutely, if you want to play a sort of super soldier, action orientated guy, you can kind or gal, you can kind of just power down that route and during character creation, create, you know, a real sort of battlefield behemoth. But it also allows you to kind of cross link characters as well. So you might have a, someone who's uh, a magic user or, or is able to wield magic, but also has a, because of their background, has a strange sort of, you know, criminal past. So they they could be a little bit shady as well, and those sort of have connections to the mob and things like that. So we try to create this system which is really flexible and gives you a lot of kind of personalization to really make a sort of your own unique character. Uh, Emmanuel and uh, John, you've hit a lot of the um, a lot of the questions I wanted to raise, but uh, one thing I wanted to ask you about, John, was um, what were the uh, challenges involved? in writing a historical horror game. You know, um, taking all of this and putting it into the theater of World War II, there must have been challenges and difficulties there. Yeah, I, th I you know, it's a very, it's a really interesting question. I mean, I'm quite, a, I sort of consider myself quite a student of history and, um, I, you know, I sort of specialized in World War II um, a long time ago during my degree. So, it's always been a fascinating uh, time for me. Um, one of the main challenges, I guess, you know, you've got to be very sensitive to the historical context. And we were always, we've always made it a rule that, you know, all the horrible things the Nazis did could never be in, within, in the Second World War, can never be attributed to the kind of influence of the mythos in game. You know, they did all that stuff on their own. So, right. you know, we, we, very, and we always want to treat history sensitively and you know, to a certain extent kind of help inform people as well because i think you know i find that the history really does in, has informed a lot of the writing and the design of the game you really are guided by the kind of um the events of the second world war but what we kind of have is we have the you know the the sort of set what we set up is the sort of surface level of the war the history that everyone knows that ran from 39 to 45 and sort of ended uh, in Berlin and with the dropping of the, the two atomic bombs. But what we say underneath this is there's this secret war raging between the sort of forces of the Nazi occult, Black Sun and Nat Wolf, who are kind of on the same side nominally, but also intense and bitter rivals. And facing them are Section M, which are Britain's occult secret service, and Majestic, who are the US's secret service. And so underneath this sort of, underneath the history that everyone knows, there's this secret war raging and it's try, you know, it's desperate, both sides are sort of trying to keep it desperately secret as they sort of make their own grab for power. And there's some interesting dynamic, it gives some great interesting dynamics there because um, we have like the Black Sun who are your classic Nazi occult sorcerers, you know, they're the ones who want to, without giving too much away, they want to <laughs> unleash the mythos on on this world and they're even kind of quite separate to the nazi regime they have their own agenda and then a splinter group from them are, are nat wolf who are night wolves and they believe in kind of wonder weapons and strange technology which is all powered by this mysterious blue crystal which is an ancient hyperborean Oh. Artifact and has, also has a very kind of well. Again, I don't want to give too much away sure, because sure. I, I know. Of course. Um, but has has a, a an extraterrestrial um, source, shall we say? But then you know it's, it's quite interesting. When I was, I kind of did quite a lot on the narrative design, and I decided that we'd also have a little bit of tension between um, the Brit Britain and the US between Majestic and Section N. Oh yeah, by and large, most of the time. They'll be working together to foil this Nazi occult menace, but um, you know, they'll, occasionally they will butt up against each other, and there'll be tension there as well. And then another thing I wanted to add in because I, you know, four factions is great, but six is even better. <laughs> so you've got the the deep ones who are you yes. know, the, the worshippers of Cthulhu, these strange undersea creatures that that featured in the Shadow over Innsmouth. And I've always found them the most fascinating race. And I've kind of cast them, you know, they, they're waiting, of course, they're waiting for the reintroduction of Cthulhu and for him to wake and take over the world. But, but 
they definitely don't want all these surface races spoiling the world while while they do it you know they view the uh you know they could view the, the the threat of the atomic bomb that could really you know that could really screw the oceans up so they're they're kind of almost environmentalists in oh, a way. i love it that's great they don't want, they don't want you know these the world war to ravage the actual earth because you know there's no point in having a great cthulhu come back and just find a barren wasteland so that's kind of a, quite an interesting thing and then finally we've got the migo as well who is strange insectoid fungoid crossbreed in acton cthulhu 2d20 they come from the outer ages of the solar system and they've been on earth for years and years and they've got these secret hive cities but who knows what their agenda is they're so strange and unknowing that uh, they're so strange and alien that we can't really tell. And so I wanted to have this sort of interplay of this six factions and they will be constantly, you know, jockeying for position, temporary alliances that broken and reforged sometimes on the same day, uh, but always, you know, seeking their own goals and advantages. So that was kind of, the, that was one of the big things I wanted to set up was this kind of, you know, this idea of, the secret war was already quite well established from the first few editions. But I wanted a kind of maelstrom as these six factions with their own agendas, you know, sort of collided with each other and forged alliances and then broke them just depending on what they were doing at that time. That sounds great. Sounds, you know, just rife with adventure. Lots of different <laughs> things going on. That sounds really exciting. Um, Absolutely. So, what can we expect uh, from the future of this line? Where where are you going to go next with this? Can you give us any hints? I know you can't give us any well, sure. information. <laughs> yeah, I can. I can kind of give you give you the, the sort of overview, really. Um, well, we want we realise that there are a lot of fans who've you know who are alcoholic Cthulhu fans and they're quite veteran players. So what we're going to do, what we're going to try and do, is have some late war campaigns who which will be for um, people who uh, have played the game before and they understand role playing and they just will they'll get a handle on the mechanics really quickly, I think. And they'll want to plunge into this sort of great big maelstrom, probably after D-Day as, as some of these epic great campaigns unfold. We've got things like uh, we will have a D-Day campaign. We'll have um, uh, one set in the Ardennes, which will probably be the first one called the Forest of Fear. We'll have um, uh, the Ashes of Berlin and then the, the fall of Fenrir's seat, which is where Nachtwolf's final sort of bastion is. Um, but also we realise, of course, that we, we want new players on board too. So we're going to have um, a couple of start campaigns, quite long and multi-linked. Um, but we'll also have sort of shorter form missions as well, sort of one-offs that we'll, um, you'll be able to just play um, starting with the quick start, actually, that's a sort of intro mission. And then we'll have uh, one which I've just written called Operation Vanguard. And then we're going to have a succession of these smaller one-off missions, as well as, you know, sort of longer, uh, longer campaigns like Shadows of Atlantis to sort of introduce new players to the game. Lovely cat, by the way. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> I find it's best to just let them in. Oh, you can't deny them. You can't deny them. The Ultarians won't be denied. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, uh, two more questions. Um, well, actually, three. Um, so, let's talk about uh, insanity. Uh, one of the things Cthulhu players love going through in a in a weird, strange way is the insanity aspect of of Cthulhu of uh, Cthulhu games. Um, how are you incorporating that with the two D twenty system? Sure. Well, I mean that was always one of the most fascinating parts of Call of Cthulhu, right? Was you'd make these rolls and you'd do your sanity checks and you'd, you'd see that that um, percentage gradually creep up as you got to know more about the mythos. You gradually became more and more insane and unbalanced. We handle it slightly differently. Um, yes, there's uh, in terms of mechanically, there's a you have a stress track, which is the amount of damage, physical or mental, that your player can um, withstand in a particular session. So you might have a, a stress track of 15, let's say, and you'd have three injuries within that stress track. So every five, 
an injury comes off. And if you have three injuries or you run out of stress, you're defeated. Entities uh, like great, from everything from great Cthulhu himself to a sort of humble, deep one, can just seeing these things can inf you know, inflict stress on you. And if you get a mental injury, or you get, or you get more than five stress in a particular, um, uh, particular uh, incident or, or whatever, you kind of, it, it, it may give you what we call a scar, a mental scar, a kind of permanent um, reminder of, of, of this incident. We handle a lot of things in 2D20 through the use of truths. So a truth is just a thing about your character that is, uh, you know, relevant to ha how or who they are. So if I saw, uh, you know, uh, the way I always think about it is if I was, my character was attacked by a spider from Leng, shall we say, one of those horrible things that, you know, haunt the plateau. And I had too much mental stress inflicted on me. I might gain the truth if I survived that um, I'd suffer from arachnophobia, my character would suffer from arachnophobia. So we don't use quite such a, a mechanical way of saying, oh, you've got so much, you know, um, so much Cthulhu mythos knowledge now, you are going to go absolute, you know, you're going to suffer from some form of insanity. What we try and do is use um, mental stress to reflect uh, a mental stress would would give you a truth about your character that would reflect their experience with the mythos. It's it's a little bit more of a flexible system, I think, and um, but we still got um, plenty of um, interesting uh, afflictions, or should we say, <laughs> should we say that players may um, experience and suggestions, of course. I mean, you know, the spider from Leng is a, a kind of example, but there's plenty more in the book. That, that, that let you kind of develop that. But yeah, it's not quite so mechanical as um, I would say as uh, Call of Cthulhu. Okay. And has the has the time frame or setting changed in any way from from uh, to this new version? Meaning meaning like like is it now like toward the beginning of the war, toward the end of the war? Is it mostly still like around in Germany? Well, we've we've tried to reflect. Um, as I say, I think we, you know, we're going to try to start um, lots of stuff at the beginning of the war and lots of stuff at the end of the war so that people um, will have something to play if they're beginners and something to play if they're veterans or they just want either of those experiences. But we've, um, you know, we, you've got to kind of give the fans what they want, right? And um, we found that in previous editions, a lot more people want a sort of Central European setting. You know, they like the war in Europe and North Africa and around the Mediterranean, that seems to be kind of where their focus is or the, the stuff that's most popular. So we'll probably have plenty of settings around there. That's not to say we won't have, you know, Eastern Front Russian settings too, um, you know, Pacific settings for, for the American-Japanese conflict. And, you know, the great thing, well, the great thing about the setting is it encompasses the entire world. So there may be strange journeys to Tibet, there may be deep probings into the um, Australian outback. It may be that you find yourself on strange islands in the sort of South America, towards South America. You know, I know that we've got at least one scenario already written and ready to go, which is set um, on homeland USA. So um, we try to, you know, we try to give it a, 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 a grand stage, I guess, you know, and use as much as possible from as many and the thing is there's so many great settings you know from Norway to uh, D-Day to North Africa it's a great canvas to work with well I can I can leave you with uh, something of an exclusive guys if you like please <laughs> well the um, we're going to be debuting the um, quick start uh, I'm going to be uh, GMing and it's going to be on Twitch TV uh, next Tuesday from 7 p.m. UK time. So if you want to see it in action, tune in then. We'll be playing um, every Tuesday uh, throughout October and um, it's uh, Twitch TV, uh, twitch.tv slash Modifius and you catch it live or you'll be able to catch it on our YouTube channel, which is just search Modifius on YouTube. So um, you can tune in for a, a day trip to France, uh, um, <laughs> which is the first uh, 
the first quick start adventure and uh, actually see some in uh, action. Uh, is there any other sites, anything else to, uh, to any other websites to look yeah, at? Yeah, you can, you know, modifius.com and um, has all the background and stuff. Modifius.net has latest news and blogs. I'll be doing a, a little bit of blogging this month about it. Um, you can join the Modifius Facebook page. You know, all the social media stuff is um, is available and there for you to, to check out. And um, we should have plenty of stuff on that. Excellent. Well, our viewers, uh, thank you for watching. And um, I hope you're excited about this as we are. And um, stay tuned for more news. Thank you.